Good evening, Dr. Peterson. Good evening, everybody. I also want to thank you first for your lectures that I've been following on YouTube mainly, and to say that they have been, well, life-changing wouldn't be an overstatement. Great, man. And I'm one of the crazy people increasing your views on YouTube because I flew in from Belgium last night to be here. Mm. And, and it's like 3 a.m. for me right now. And English is not my first language, so uh, bear with me. Um, I, I would have many burning questions to ask you, but I thought it was fair and necessary to pick one. And it would be this one. There are concepts that recur in your lectures, but this one you only mentioned once in your early videos on Bill C-16. Um, about self-esteem. You said you don't believe in the existence of self-esteem. That when you teach children they're all special, you think you boost their confidence, but the only result is that some get narcissistic. The reason why I'm interested in that is about standing up for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it is, and when I try to, you know, uh, do it, yep. I see that um, rational arguments, faith in rationality, doesn't get the best results in negotiations. That's why you learn how to be socialized by playing rough and tumble. It's not a, an intellectual conversation that gets you socialized. So I'm also reading that book you suggested about, uh, by Stephen Hicks, explaining postmodernism, because yep. I wasn't really familiar and I've been listening to a lot I'm from I'm gonna you. talk to him later this week, so that might be fun. And I'm trying to read with fresh eyes because I've been indoctrinated by you, of course, so I'm very critical. And there's one more point that I have to agree with uh, the postmodernists, and that is the world seems to me, as I observe it, a place where powers are at play. It's not rationality that leads that. So when I'm in a weak position and I want to fight back, not to get resentful, I find that it's not a rational argument that will get me there. There's something else that I don't do and that I should be doing and I don't know what it is. Okay. So you see the relation with self-esteem. Yeah. Seems to me that people who think of themselves start in a better position in, in this game. Okay. okay, so okay, okay, great, yeah. All right, so there's a lot in that question. So the first thing is, is there's a problem with the measurement of self-esteem. And that actually matters because self-esteem is a psychological concept, a scientific concept, if you like, and you have to get the measurement right. And you can predict self-esteem almost perfectly by measuring someone's extroversion and subtracting from that their negative emotionality or neuroticism. So it's actually just a combination of big five traits. And so people who are extroverted, who feel a lot of positive emotion, and who, are, and who don't feel a lot of negative emotion, score high on scales of self-esteem. Okay, so conceptually, it's a non-starter because you're not going to move people's levels of neuroticism, let's say, by trying to get them to feel good about themselves. Okay, now, having said that, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't encourage people, right? Now, there's this psychologist named Jerome Kagan, who's quite a great psychologist, developmental psychologist. Uh, I think he's an emeritus at Harvard at the, at the, at the moment. He studied temperamentally inhibited children. Uh, you can, so they're basically kids who are high in eroticism, probably low in extroversion. And he found that if those children, and you can identify them as early as six months, right? It's very, very inculcated in their temperament. Um, he found that if you encouraged them in the world, you could shift them into a more stable personality configuration. And what you basically did was, when they were manifesting signs of distress, instead of encouraging them to withdraw and retreat, which is what they might be attempting to do, you encourage them to go out and explore. So, for example, if you have a temperamentally inhibited child and you go to a playground, and there's kids out there, like, if you have an extroverted, emotionally stable kid, three years old, as you put them on the ground, their feet are already moving, right? Like a puppy over water, and you let them go and they just run to the to the kids, and they're there, and then you have to drag them away. But if you have a temperamentally inhibited child, the child will sort of stand around your legs and sort of peek out, you know. And then what you do is wait it out, let them watch, 
encourage them to move a little bit forward, encourage them to take their steps out into the unknown and the strange land, and don't let them withdraw. Like, you can do it, you have, they're slower to warm up, they'll warm up, they'll habituate. And if you continually expose your inhibited child to the things that make them anxious in measured doses, then you can transform their psychophysiological temperament. Now, you're probably not going to shift them way the hell out onto the extroverted, emotionally stable end, but you can make a big difference. That's very different than making them feel good about themselves, which is such a... You need to curse. You need to curse when you discuss that concept, right? So, it isn't improve their self-esteem. It isn't how you feel about yourself, right? It's how you act effectively in the world, and how you're trained to do that. So, okay, now, then you were talking about negotiation, right? And you said, well, don't, you said something like, don't people who feel good about themselves, aren't they able to negotiate better? And it's, it's I know that's a poor paraphrase, excuse me, but, um, negotiation is actually a practical issue to some degree. Like, the first thing is that you have to figure out what you want. Because you were saying, well, it's not merely rational. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. You have to bargain from a position of authority, let's say, not power. Authority is a better word. But you don't have authority unless you know what you're talking about, and unless you can bring some, unless you can bring some, let's say, force. It's not, that's not the right word. You can't negotiate without, with anyone unless you can say no. And you can't say no unless you've set yourself up with alternatives. So when you go to your boss and you negotiate for a raise, you need to have the sort of CV that enables you to go find another job. And you have to have your CV prepared, and you have to have looked for another job, and you have to be able to get one. Because then you can go in there and say, um, I'm not as productive as I could be at my current level of remuneration. It's not reflective of what I'm able to do, and uh, I want this, and this is what will happen if you give me this. This will be the good things that will happen, and what do you think of that? And the person is going to know, even by the way that you hold yourself while you're having the discussion, whether or not you're someone with options. And you can't fake that. Well, you can, but it's not helpful. Like, it, it just doesn't work for very many iterations. You have to, it's, it's, it's not rational. You're preparing yourself for battle. That's what you're doing. And you can't be weak when you prefer, prepare yourself for battle. Because if the person says, no, I'm not giving you a raise, which is exactly what they should say, because what are they going to do? Just, like, sprinkle the money around? You need to be able to say, okay then, there will be consequences that you don't like. And that's what it means to say no to someone. No means, if you continue to push this, things will happen that you don't like. Now, in that case, it'll be, all depart and take my talents with me. And if they don't care, well, then you're in the wrong business, or you don't have any talents to begin with, right? Which is, so, in, in order to negotiate properly, and, and, and this is more difficult for people who are agreeable, for example, and because they tend to be more conflict-averse, you have to put yourself in a position where you can, you can push back as hard as you're going to be pushed on. And that means you have to open, your, you have to open up your space of available options. Because otherwise, the person says no, and that's it. You're done. Well, you'll lose then. It's, it's as straightforward as that. Now, with regards to the self-esteem part, is practice on small things. Because you build the skills. Forget about the self-esteem. It isn't about being confident or feeling confident or any of that. It's about knowing bloody well how to negotiate. Start with small things. You know? So you'll notice that there are things in your relationships in particular that aren't the way you want them to be. And that you could see how could be improved. It's like, figure out how they can be improved. Negotiate with your partner. Make the incremental improvement. Keep doing that. You'll get better and better at it. And then you'll be able to go out and have a harder negotiation in the world. So, it's a set of skills. There's an attitude behind it, you know, and it's easier for some people than others. But, fundamentally, it's a set of skills. No problem.